I know I've certainly talked about it on here many times over the past decade of doing these videos, and I am certainly not the only one that has expressed some similar sentiment. That, you know, we talk about the Attitude Era, the Monday Night Wars, however you want to classify it, and just how great of a time it was in terms of professional wrestling. That, for me and many others, we may look at other years for certain companies and say, like, for WWF, you could look at 98, 99 and argue they are truly better years. But I look back very fondly at 1997, both in WWF history and wrestling as a whole, and point to that and say that's perhaps my favorite year in wrestling ever. ECW got their first, you know, formal pay-per-view off the ground with Barely Legal. They were arguably the hottest they ever were. WCW had the NWO. You had Sting coming after the NWO. Mix in the Luger title win in August, I believe it was, of that year, right before the pay-per-view. I mean, WCW was so incredibly hot then. And then you look at WWF, and you go back to a show like this one, King of the Ring 1997. And they weren't all the way there. There's just no doubt at the time that from a, an appeal standpoint, rating standpoint, like WCW was kicking the WWF's ass. There's no question about that. But you could start to see where this company was starting to figure things out. Again, they weren't all the way there yet. Like you... You look at this time in WWF history and you say, okay, man, even when you start to see this compared to, let's say, King of the Ring 96, then compared to King of the Ring 98, holy cow, the transformation in the product, the presentation, everything was incredibly striking, severe, significant, and absolutely, totally necessary. But it's this middle time here in 1997, when you look back from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and you see all the evolution, you see the change in the characters, change in storytelling, change in presentation, the product itself. I could go on and on and on. I love this year in WWF history. It wasn't the best, but it's my favorite because of the growth and the change that you could see happening. And this, and this show is a perfect embodiment of 1997. Whereas WrestleMania 13 was kind of shitty, this show, while not perfect, you could tell they were starting to figure some things out. There's still some awkward things, but you've got new talent that's coming into really their own, starting to really enter their prime and their peak of what they could do. Like just a lot of good memories going back and watching this. Now, obviously King of the Ring 1997 is nowhere near as memorable as King of the Ring 1998 and for legitimate obvious reasons. But again, I come back to this show and I look at you know, the difference of the product and look at, for example, you, this time of mid-1997, they were still calling him Hunter Hearst Helmsley. They hadn't figured out, hey, let's fucking shorten this up to Triple H. Vince insisted for some reason on having him called and continue to be called the Blue Blood Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Now, eventually we got past that in the months to follow, but around this time, like, you could see that he was a good ring technician. You could see that he had good timing. He was a good storyteller. The character, like he had done the best with, but at this point in time, by now, you're starting to change him. You've got him aligned with China. That certainly uh, makes a difference here. Um, I mean, he wasn't all the way there, but he was getting there. His semifinal match was against Ahmed Johnson. And back in that time, you would have put money on Ahmed Johnson being the first black WWF world champion. Like that would have been the smart money. Because it was clearly obvious back then that even Vince was a really big fan of his. And they did push him. And they put him in some big spots. Like even when you look at the way this pay-per-view ended and what happened immediately afterwards, like, you know, there were certainly big plans for Ahmed Johnson. It's always been a disappointment that they didn't really work out. Now the semi-final match between the two of these guys, like they did, you know, an average at best match. Like 
If you want to go back and watch, there are matches on the show that are worth going back and watching. This is not one of them. But, you know, again, you're talking about Ahmed Johnson. You think a little bit about the disappointment of what could have been and ultimately wasn't. But you start to really see here how you're piecing together something slowly with Hunter. Especially when you talk about throwing China in the mix. Good God. Um, the other King of the Rings semifinal match, because, of course, in these years... For some reason, Jerry the King Lawler was Mr. King of the Ring because every year he had a match and it was always a bad one. This was by far the least shitty of Lawler's first four King of the Ring matches. By far the least shitty. Um, Mankind beat him with the mandible claw. The finish was pretty cool. It wasn't a great match or anything, but again, you talk about 1997 Mankind. You've moved on a little bit from the Taker stuff. You're... You know, now presenting him as a little more sympathetic of a figure. Like, you can, again, you're, you're starting to figure out with Mankind what you're looking at here. He had a singles match with Goldust defeating Crush. And I wish Tony was here so he could shit all over Crush. <laughs> but Goldust at this point, you know, I think sometimes he's more remembered for being this great character than what a lot of people, if they were around back then, 24, 25 years ago, would have remembered. They would have looked at him as this androgynous freak show that, you know, made people feel homophobic ways and made him feel uncomfortable and uneasy. Um, but you could tell that this crowd in Providence, Rhode Island was certainly uh, behind him and the, and the shtick worked pretty well. And it, it's always funny to me when you think about the nation of domination, like you talk about a timely angle, you know, around the time that in the mid 90s that uh, Minister Farrakhan and his Nation of Islam were certainly in the news a lot especially around the time of the Million Man March. And you think back to, you know, this group in its early days, yes, you had Farouk, because we couldn't call him Rollins Simmons, but we called him Farouk, and it worked out in the long term. But um, you had guys like Crush in the fucking nation. I miss Clarence Mason, but, you know, starting again, this is where I'm talking about, you're starting to get the gem of the idea of some of these things, but they haven't quite figured it all out yet. It's a good reminder sometimes for us with wrestling and storytelling in general that sometimes you throw things out there and you find out something works and then something doesn't and then you start to work at it and it can take time to kind of mold that lump of clay. Um, yeah, the six-man tag match, the Heart Foundation defeats the Legion of Doom and Psycho Sid. Like, just the fact that I'm calling out, you know, the Legion of Doom and Psycho Sid on a team and then you've got the Heart Foundation, like, that's fucking fantastic. It feels like you're living in the early 90s again. But the, some of these guys were adapting and changing with the times. And, you know, freaking Psycho Sid, anytime you give him a live mic on pay-per-view, you never know what the fuck you're going to get other than pure awesome. Pure awesome. The match itself wasn't exactly pure awesome, but fuck it. I got to see the Road Warriors and Psycho Sid. I got to see Owen Hart again and the British Bulldog and Jim the Anvil Nightheart. And if you really want to get morbid about this fucking match, this is King of the Ring 1997. I want you to think about something. The only man still alive from this match is Psycho Sid. Davy Boy's gone. Owen's gone. Nightheart's gone. Hawk and Animal both gone. Psycho Sid of all people, is the only damn one left. Now, you talk about some crazy-ass shit right there. I guess that's just a good reminder of how much softball keeps you healthy. Um, but the King of the Ring final match, you know, this is where it starts to get stronger here. The next two matches in particular, when I talk about matches that were are worth going back and watching, there are two of them on this show. The first one is Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Mankind uh, in the King of the Ring final match. Uh, it's interesting that this crowd at one point in time was, was chanting boring during the match. Like, they didn't always have them. They didn't always hook them. But by the time shit got to get, like, it works. And I went back and watching this, I certainly enjoyed it. And, you know, this was kind of the spawning of, you know, the beginning of a run of great back and forth between these two men as you went into the summer of 97. And obviously, down the road a couple of years later, like, these two guys always really fit well together. They worked well together. Their chemistry was outstanding. Uh, this match is good. The Shawn Michaels versus Stone Cold Steve Austin match. Like these guys were tag team champions at the time. You know, they would do that stuff sometimes. Like they were on a tag team, but they faced each other. But they didn't do it to the way they do now. And they always try to tease the tension. 
can they coexist? You know, that stupid ass overdone lame buzzword. But here, like it was a bigger deal in 1997. And here in middle of 1997, like Sean's Sean, but man, Austin is fucking coming. And you could sense it, you could feel it, you could see it. And this was a big spot for him to work against a former world champion and, you know, one of the top guys along with Brett and Taker in this company and Shawn Michaels. Like, this is a big test for Austin. And you're kind of talking about here, like, this is peak HBK in terms of his career in 97. This is close to physical peak Austin before the neck injury uh, suffered at SummerSlam. Like, you could tell this dude's going to be something big, even right here. And that just happened in the course of, you know, a year's time from King of the Ring 96 to King of the Ring 97. Like, the, Austin was starting to become something. And, you know, fascinating thing about going to this match, something that's memorable, is at the beginning of the match, I don't know, I can't, I don't know what the hell happened where the uh, special needs kid came up and was like pointing in the ring and he was pointing at Austin. And what's fascinating to me about the way that this played out is like the guys in the ring could have totally ignored it. But they saw, Shawn Michaels in particular, saw that the security was really trying to fuck up this special needs kid. And he went out there the first time and kind of got him to stop a little bit, but then got to it. And you want to talk about like some of that swinging big dick energy? Like you're in a featured match on this pay-per-view and you've got a role to do play and you've got to get out there and get the job done and the company's got a lot behind you. But to sit there and basically say, eh, fuck this. I'm going to do what the hell I want because I'm HBK. Like, you know, that's some swing and big dick energy that we frankly could all aspire to. Like, sometimes you just fucking go do it because it's the right thing to do. And you could tell, like, Austin and HBK, at the beginning, they were talking a little bit, trying to figure out what the fuck exactly is going on and what the hell to do. They play it off for a minute or two, and then eventually HBK works his way around and helps kind of escort the kid backs off security. I guess a memorable moment, <laughs> you know, and for a guy like Sean, who was pretty generally thought of at this stage of his career in life as a, being a pretty big piece of shit, like this is not the type of moment, you might have expected this more out of a Bret Hart than you would have a Sean Michaels, but it was actually well played by him uh, to make sure that this young man got, got, got away from the ring area safely, you know, and <laughs> they got the fuck out of there <laughs> but Shawn Michaels versus Stone Cold ends in a double disqualification the way I kind of look at this was it was a bit of a test run you know like you're you're teasing them for the stampede show the next go round but you're also talking about you know, it was an in your house Canadian stampede I think was the next show after this is they had Brett cut a promo um, but if you think about it like you had Shawn Michaels and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Less than a year later, these two guys are main eventing WrestleMania 14 with Mike Tyson as the guest enforcer for the WWF Championship. It was a good test run to see, like, hey, could this work on a main event stage? And it certainly did. Your main event is kind of weird and one-off. Like, it was The Undertaker defending against Farouk from the Nation of Domination. But you talk about a weird combination there. But they did it. The match was about as good as you could expect between Taker and Farouk. Like, Farouk was never, like, prone to producing classic matches. You got a standard kind of, like, mid-late 90s WWF big man match. Uh, biggest thing here is it, it's a great reminder of how WWE used to be able to legitimately do long-term storytelling. Like, the whole thing here is that Undertaker is doing Paul Bearer's bidding because Paul Bear's got a secret and that gives him all the power over Undertaker. Well, you think about what they were teasing eventually, you find out they're teasing Kane, his, your brother's alive! Taker! Kane's alive! And then you get the debut at Bla Bad Blood 97 and you're off to the fucking races to WrestleMania there, but even then, like, you would have him face off, you'd have slight touch, but they didn't actually wrestle like in today's world, you'd fucking have one week of tease, Kane would show up, and then they'd wrestle at the next pay-per-view. Like that slow build and being able to do that, which is something they absolutely cannot do anymore on a consistent basis. To be able to go back and see that even here, like they were already thinking in June about what the fuck they were going to do in October, which meant they were building towards this at WrestleMania. It was fantastic stuff. 
And then this is where you saw the big change in the nation and you had Ahmed Johnson come out at the end and fuck with Undertaker. And that's where you got to uh, <laughs> the kind of race war factions in WWE F at the time where you had Farouk was joined now by Ahmed Johnson. You had D'Lo Brown there. So you've got the fucking Black Nation. you got the fucking uh, <laughs> crushing his white skinhead biker group. D Hey, wasn't it? And then you've got Los Bariquas headed by Savio Vega. Like, it's fucking weird. Um, but just an average, like, main event, honestly. Like I said, it's not truly a classic show. Um, it certainly is not the best show the company put on in 1997. But goddamn, like, you talk about important, significant years in the history of WWF, 1997 is it. Also, you could say that for the wrestling business as a whole in that time too. But it is fun to go back and watch these shows because as you watch the first couple of years, you see some of these guys grow, change, and start to really figure it out, and the company's starting to figure it out. It's a lot of fun to go back and see like where they had been, where they got to, and you also know like where this is all leading to, and that's pretty cool. Um, not one match that I said that you would absolutely have to watch no matter what. I would sit down and watch Triple H versus Mankind work again all fucking day. And Shawn Michaels versus Stone Cold was really good too.